We're going to turn this morning in God's Word to the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 17. And as I mentioned earlier, we're talking about the, the role of human authority and how we view that in our world that belongs to God. And uh, this is picking up on themes that we've been working through in our contemporary testimony. We read those a few minutes ago. And we'll be looking at how this happened in ancient Israel. What were some of the principles that God put in place for the ways that his people should relate to the authorities over them? And what can we learn from that today? Deuteronomy 17, beginning at verse 8. This is about law courts, and then we'll talk about the king in just a minute. If cases come before your courts that are too difficult for you to judge, whether bloodshed or lawsuits or assaults, take them to the place the Lord your God will choose. Go to the Levitical priests and to the judge who is in office at that time. Inquire of them, and they will give you a verdict. You must act according to the decisions they give you at the place the Lord will choose. Be careful to do everything they instruct you. Act according to whatever they teach you and the decisions they give you. Do not turn aside from what they tell you to the right or to the left. Anyone who shows contempt for a judge or a priest who stands ministering there to the Lord, your God, is to be put to death. You must purge the evil from Israel. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, and you've taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the other nations around us. Be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. You must be from among your fellow Israelites. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not an Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the Levitical priests. It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to reveal, revere the Lord his God, and may follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees, and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites, and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time, over his kingdom in Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, friends of Jesus, I don't know if you've heard, but there's an election this week. You picked up on that somewhere, maybe in your news feed there was one or maybe two articles about it somewhere. I think when we look at the role of politics in our nation today, it's hard to escape because it's always in front of you, right? There's always somebody telling you that you should vote for somebody or something or, you know, telling you why not to vote for the other person. And I don't think I have to tell you that we live at a time of quite deep political divisions in our country today. Now, this is not a new thing in our country. These seasons come and go. In fact, there's been a time once where the person in a presidential election who, didn't have, who, who had the most electoral votes didn't actually win the presidency. I'm trying to figure out how that works, you can talk to Mr. Vandenberg or Mr. DeWeird or something later on, and they'll, they'll give you a civics lesson and how that happens. There was a time when a, a senator was nearly clubbed to death in the floor of the Senate by another member of the House of Representatives. So I don't think we have to panic because somehow in our political system this is unknown. But at the same time, we need to recognize that the divisions in our country run deep right now, and Christians find themselves caught up in battles of various sorts, trying to distinguish what's a theological belief, what's a principle that, is, that we can't compromise on, and what's merely a question of political opinion, whether it's on something about the size of the federal bureaucracy or what tax policy should be or what we should do about immigration or how we should address the moral issues around us in our country. Which are questions about which side of the political aisle you land on? And which ones are reflections on the human heart and its condition before God? Now, the question of godly government, of course, has been with God's people for a long time. In fact, ever since human beings first began to be organized into societies. And we can see this throughout the Bible. We can see that, you know, even though we think most of the time of kind of national governments, state governments, and that sort of thing, but there's governments in other ways, right? The household is a basic unit of government, right? The authority of the parents that we have to respond to. 
Some of you have to deal with the authority that happens in school every week, right? You go to your teachers, and your teacher is an authority over you, and you have to respond to that authority and figure out how to live with that authority and to do so respectfully. <clears throat> we interact with employers at work. Perhaps we have had run-ins with police officers along the road sometime, and we have to figure out how to respect them. But of course, when we think about authorities, what we think of most of all is the authority of government. <clears throat> this goes back, too, a long ways. The Bible talks in Genesis 10 already about the division of the world into nations. And we see that over the course of history that nations organize themselves in different ways, different forms of leadership. And so what we want to see this morning is what we confess together in our contemporary testimony, that God does establish government, and it's our responsibility as citizens to respect these authorities and work with to influence them as part of our life before God in this world. We live under the authorities that rule, and we work with, we walk together trying to see how we can observe ways of God's righteousness, God's justice coming into greater being in our world around us. That's the context of Deuteronomy. It's what God's people Israel were supposed to be and to do. Now, I'm, I'm not equating God's people Israel and our country here. They're different things. But, but how does the church, in living under the authorities under which it lives, how do we in the church then live out as our call to be instruments of God's righteousness and God's justice in the world? Now, our text this morning takes us back to a different time, a moment in Israel's history when the form of government for God's people was a very live topic of conversation. Under Moses, the people followed kind of a charismatic leader who spoke for God. He was both kind of the, the civil and the religious authority of his own day. And that model would prevail with greater and lesser degrees of stability for the nation for several centuries, from the time of Joshua, who followed Moses, up and through the judges, until the people of Israel in 1 Samuel 8 first asked for a king. But already in Moses' day, it seems that there's a national awareness that the form of government might change at some point. And so we find God setting out some principles for how his people ought to relate to their leaders in whatever way those leaders would be organized. And we're going to look this morning at, first of all, at the judges and then at the kings of Israel, at least as God intended them to be, and then try to understand what does it mean for us to live under the authority of admittedly imperfect government in a world that belongs to God. So first of all, what do we see about God's intention for courts of law? Now, the instructions about judges actually go back a few verses. If you go back to the end of chapter 16, we see that God is explaining that there should be people in place in Israelite society to ensure that there was justice among the people. Part of the role of, of civil society is to help us see reflections of who God is. That God is a God who cares about people. That God is a God of justice. God is a God of fairness. God is a God of rightness. God is a God of order. And the legal system of Israel was one that was designed to show that. It was designed to show that private vengeance or twisting things for our own personal advantage is not the way that we should exercise authority or influence in our world. Rather, society is to protect the rights of all. <clears throat> now, in the verses that we read, we find provisions for consulting other higher authorities when especially difficult or significant cases would be encountered on a lower level. And again, this is a good principle, right? We see it in our government. We see it, you know, our, our court system, that there's, there's kind of tiers as you go up the system. You know, maybe there's something that happens in traffic court that, you know, can be handled on a very local level. But if there's a principle that comes out of that that, that needs further discussion, it just kind of goes up the ladder and to, to bigger and wider scope. The same thing happens in church government. The authority of the council here at Fairlawn is we, we have a lot of influence and a lot of decision-making ability here on, on the local level. But there's something that's more of a, a principial matter that needs to be decided or discussed. It can go up to our classes, our regional assembly, or it can go from there to our senate, our national assembly. In the Israelite context, the legal system also had close ties to the religious system, and so in these cases require, that require consultation, requires uh, the involvement of priests who are Levites, verse 9 tells us. Now, interestingly, in the Israelite system, this doesn't seem to have been an appeal, at least in the way that we'd understand that. Rather, it's more of a consultation. 
so that the principles that are, are kind of decided up here on the, the secondary level can come back down and, and determine how we decide the case in the local level. In verses 10 and 11, we, the, the words, the decisions they give you, literally translates as the word they teach. Now, that's kind of an interesting translation, I think. Because it gives the case, gives law in general more of a tutoring function. In other words, the function of the court system in Israel, and I think you could argue the function of a court system anywhere in some sense, is to help not just restrain evil and punish bad people, but it's to teach us. It's to teach us how we are to live, in Israel's case, in a world that belongs to God. What are the things that matter most? What kind of a society should we be? And that's why what we have in, on the books in terms of law and what courts decide does matter. Because it's saying, you know, this is what we want to be and to do in, as a nation in terms of our policies toward whatever it is. We are learning how to do good, what is good. We want to be instruments of God's restorative mercies. Now, of course, in order for the law and the authorities to have that function, people have to be willing to accept their instruction. So Moses tells the people in verse 10 to do, be careful to do everything the judges tell you to do. And verse 12, he says, avoid share, showing contempt for the authorities. The attitude towards authority is a particular concern in this chapter. You can see that throughout. The word contempt portrays a person who thinks that they're better than everybody else, that they know more, that they're on top of their game more, and so they're deliberately kind of disrupting what's going on around them and trying to go out of their way to, to do their own thing. <clears throat> and of course, in the Israelite system, we read that there's actually a death penalty for that sort of thing. Now, in our own system, we don't see that played out maybe quite to that, with that severity. But what God is saying here is, is really, it's not just about the punishment, but it's about the fact that that kind of behavior, that sort of disruptiveness, that contempt for people in authority over us, ultimately it's self-destructive. It doesn't help us and it doesn't help anyone around us. It just tears the system apart. <clears throat> and so God gives instructions about judges. He also secondly gives some instructions about the king. One particular person who would rise to leadership in the Israelite system. Now again, as we said, in Moses' day, the political structure in Israel was different. It was you know, kind of a charismatic leader, and there was no system for replacing that leader from time to time. However, this recognizes that the form of government itself is somewhat of an indifferent thing before God. And so we can find churches throughout the course of history that have lived faithfully and obediently under democracies. We can also find churches that have lived faithfully and obediently under monarchies or other systems of government. And Moses even acknowledges here, God allows his people sometimes to learn from the nations around you. That's where they're going to get the model for, 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 um, for the monarchy. They're going to look around them at the other nations and say in verse 14, you know what, we should do sort of what they're doing. That could be a good system for us. Now, there are limits to that too when we get to 1 Samuel 8 where the Israelites do actually ask for a king, we find there that they're asking maybe with some mixed motives, that, that God has some things to say about how they're careful, they need to be careful with what they desire in their hearts about what government should be and do. But we can say that there's lots of things that we can learn, even from the secular world around us, about how to organize things well. But what matters most is the character of our leadership and what that does to God's people as citizens. That we are to be people, especially as citizens, not just of this country, but as citizens of God's kingdom. We are to be people who live out our call to follow Jesus and to witness to him in the way that we live, by our words, by our deeds. And so God offers some restrictions on the power of a king. First of all, we read in verse 15 that the king needs to be an Israelite, not a foreigner. Now, in some ways, we look at that and we think, well, that would be obvious, right? Why would you want a foreigner to rule over you? But apparently this did actually happen from time to time in the ancient Near East. <clears throat> but the problem is not mainly ethnicity here or nationality. The problem is really what we might call worldview. Somebody who comes in from the outside is not going to share Israel's worldview for what they understand to be the nature of God and his call, his relationship to the world and, the, and the, his relationship to his people. And so Israel is warned against really kind of pragmatic political alliances here that would bring into, their, into their, their system of government their, something that would, that would undermine who they are as a people. 
Now, again, we're not trying to draw a strict correlation between America and Israel, but I think we can see in terms of the church, we do need to be aware of the influence that our national leaders, our state leaders, our local leaders have on who we, who we are as a church. And be sure that we're look, the leadership that we're looking to in the church models who God would have us be as his people. Now, Israel generally seems to have abided by the rule that their king should be an Israelite, but the prophets have plenty of warnings about the other things that Moses does, says here about limits on the people of God, limits on the king, sorry. That the nations, the king should not acquire many horses, he says in verse 16. Now, does God have something about horses? No, that's not why God is you know, forbidding many horses here. This has to do with military technology. Horses are kind of advanced military technology. They're viewed as sort of, you know, they're the greatest protection that a nation could have is lots of cavalry and lots of horses. And Israel is warned against not putting its faith there. It would also lead you into strategic trade alliances, in, in Israel's case with Egypt. Maybe there's a pragmatic warning about, you know, if you want lots of horses from Egypt, you have to give them mercenary soldiers, and the mercenary soldiers, again, get kind of stuck in Egypt, and that's not good. What kind of a nation, what kind of a people should we be? The same concerns are in view with the instructions in verse 17 about accumulating wives or monetary wealth. Symbols of privilege, symbols of prestige in the ancient world. And God says, I want those who lead my people to be different, to have other values. And the solution in verse 18 to 20, is a deep and lasting commitment to God's law. The king was to keep a copy of God's law on hand. Refer to it regularly, regularly, dedicate himself to obeying it, and therefore would be sufficiently humble to understand that he is a place not over God's people, but among God's people. And a place, most importantly, under God. Now, we hear all of this about kings and judges and so forth, and we ask ourselves, well, how does all of this help us think about our current political situation? Because we don't have kings, and our court system is admittedly different than Israel's. There's similarities, but admittedly different. And I think we can recognize, even in this passage, that even for Israel, the patterns that are set are kind of ideal ones. This is how your king ought to act in an ideal world, and what happens in Israel, and what happens with our leaders as well, is that we see people falling far short of what God would ideally have us be. Because that's who we are as human beings. All of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. And so even when, when we, maybe in this church building, who are committed to being, trying to follow Jesus and trying to do what we want, what, what he wants us to do, in our roles and authority, we fall short too. So what, how would we not expect that of our leaders? But we can also look at the attitude towards government that we find in the New Testament. And see how God's Spirit calls us to live under the authority of less than ideal governments. Even corrupt rulers like the Roman emperors, God tells us, have been established by God and are worthy of our honor. You know, we read Romans 13 a few minutes ago in time of confession. <clears throat> Paul didn't write Romans 13 about the ideal government. He wrote this about Roman emperors who would be the forces to persecute the church. And so Paul is not writing us, telling us, hey, you know what, if you've got an ideal government, that's when you obey them. If not, you throw all this stuff out the window. <clears throat> Our confessions say the same thing. In the Heidelberg Catechism, when it talks about the fifth commandment and what God intends for us about authority, we are told that we are to be patient with the failings of authorities over us because it is through them that God rules us. Belgian Confession, Article 36, says something similar. And so in some ways, what we're doing as God's people in this world is trusting that God can use sometimes even less than ideal rulers to do those things we talk about in the contemporary testimony, to do public justice or work for peace. You can read all of those things later on in the back of the hymnal if you want, page 1036. Because we trust that God's redemptive power can transform even evil intentions into expressions of his grace. And we see that no more than at the cross, right? Here's the cross. This is the greatest travesty of injustice. As Jesus, our perfect Savior, is put to death by, by the authorities in a cruel and unusual way. Well, maybe not unusual in their day, but from our perspective, this would be cruel and unusual punishment. And yet God uses that to bring redemption, his redemption, into the world. And so especially in our democratic society where we have the ability to vote and express our opinions freely, <clears throat> 
We want to make sure that we use those privileges to work for, to call for the realization of ideals, even at the same time that we're realistic about the failings of those who are over us. So what are we supposed to do with the specific provisions of Deuteronomy? <clears throat> I want to talk briefly just about four principles, godly principles for our world today that we can see in this text and elsewhere in Scripture. First of all, I think Deuteronomy reminds us that we need to look at our attitude. I need to look at the attitude of my heart. And we need to look at the attitude of your heart. As we, as we look at those in authority over us and say, how am I looking to those who are ruling me? Whether it's at the government level, at, you know, in school, whatever it is. And Deuteronomy warns in verses 11 and 12 against contempt, warning that it's ultimately self-destructive. <clears throat> and again, I don't have to tell you that we live in a time when our politics are saturated with contempt. We have members of political parties, sometimes even you know, leaders in political parties who can't talk to each other, who can't even really acknowledge that the other person might have a point or where their, their way of thinking comes from. And when this happens, especially when it happens in the church, that we can't talk to each other about politics because we, we can't even acknowledge where somebody's line of thinking is coming from or going. We don't have to agree with it, but just to even acknowledge it. There's something wrong. And it might say less about the structure of our political system than it does about the condition of our own heart and our humility. One of the things that I appreciate about the contemporary testimony is that it does a lot in these sections about the mission of the church. It identifies issues of moral concern. But it does so in a way that doesn't lock us in as a church to saying, well, there has to be only one Christian way of thinking about all of the political issues that are out there. And so what we see is before God, I may disagree with you, I may disagree with our leaders on a certain issue, but, but if I'm willing to slander and disrupt or undermine you, then maybe I need to ask about the state of my heart. And I think there's a temptation for all of us. I know that I see that myself sometimes. You read something in the news or you watch something on, on TV or on the computer and, and you go, why are those crazy people thinking that? And then you have to stop and think, wait, wait a second. In somebody's world, this might make sense. How does it make sense? I might disagree with it. I might think it's wrong or immoral. But how does it make sense that I can see that person as a person? So assess our own heart and our own attitude. Secondly, Deuteronomy prompts us to assess our expectations for the authorities. <clears throat> you look at this, this chapter, the verses that we read, you see a number of times where it says something like, the Lord your God has given you or the Lord your God has chosen. And I think one of the things that we recognize in this world that we need to recognize is that we always live basically in two kingdoms. We live under the authority of the kingdom of God, but we also live under the authorities that God has placed over us in this world. And what applies in one does not necessarily apply in the other. What applies to Israel's government in this text does not necessarily apply to American government. Principles might cover, but, but maybe not every detail. In fact, some ways what we say about Israel and its government applies more to the church because the church is the instrument, not the government in, this, in, in our country. The church is the instrument of God's redemptive message in the world. Even in Israel, we see that the judges and the kings at their best are to instruct people how to reflect God's reign in the world, way that they live. But we can, we can see they only can do so, so much in the face of human sin to make the kingdom of God come. And there's a temptation, I think, in every generation, but we see it around us today, too. And it runs across the political spectrum to imagine that if we just put the right people, if we just put the right policies in place, then we would be on the verge of ushering in paradise. We see it sometimes in a sort of aggressive social activism that can't tolerate any kind of compromise with our ideals. It's going to wipe the past free from all of the things that those, those foolish people back then did. We also see it in a kind of view that, that kind of collapses Christian message into what the government is doing and acts as if the government is going to be the agent of God's reign and rule here on earth. And what we see in, the, in both is that it kind of undermines the gospel and the work of the truth, the work of the church. 
because it's making some sort of human authority, the agent through which redemption and change and transformation happens, or redemption and change and transformation that only happen in the human heart because of God and who he is. And that's not to say that it's not wonderful to elect Christians to office or see policies implemented that reflect God's holiness and his care for the world, his care for his people. We ought to be lifting that up whenever we can. But when it falls short, we don't panic and say, oh my goodness, it's all lost for us. Because the Bible portrays that God will continue to be present in his world through the church to get the message of his redemption out. And the Bible portrays that sometimes even unbelieving rulers, sometimes even those who have no interest in acknowledging the rule and the reign of God over all things, sometimes even those kinds of rulers can be used by God to do tremendous good. And so we need to be careful that we adjust our expectations and don't expect our governments to do the work that only God can do. The third thing that we see here is that this doesn't, however, free us from making assessments about those who rule us. Character does matter, just as it did for the kings of Israel. We should call our rulers to be honorable and truthful and just and fair, to implement policies that bring harmony and righteousness. It should trouble us when our rulers are intentionally divisive or when they're intentionally insulting to those around them, when their personal lives undermine the trust that the public places in them. In Deuteronomy, we see that one of the calls of government, of authority, is to purge evil. And again, this happens in the home, doesn't it? It happens with public safety around us. It happens with our town officials. It happens with our national governments and international organizations. We're trying to get rid of the worst excesses, at least in a good world we should be. That's a goal. But we also... And so we, we live in a way that, <clears throat> that when we're talking about our politics, we are realistic about the kinds of people that we're trying to put in office. It's not wrong to respectfully challenge leaders or policies whose character are deficient. All the time, however, recognizing the danger of contempt, the danger of reaching out and, and responding as if we are setting ourselves above those authorities. We need to recognize that character matters and live in a way that reflects as much as possible our desire that those who exercise authority over us would be people of character. But that then brings us to our, our final principle this morning, that we're not living for the achievements of this world, but for the glory of God. One of the things that we see in Israel that made them different from the nations around them is that the people are always answering to God. It's not about the glory of the nation, It's not about the glory of the king. It's not about the the glory of the judge. What it is is about the glory of God. And so Israel's king, Israel's courts, exist before the face of God, in the places that God chooses, under the law that God, God puts into place. And so with the king, We commit ourselves to reading God's word and ordering our lives around it. And that means reading it not just as a proof text for our positions on certain issues, which is, again, a temptation that I think all of us have on some level. We open the Bible and we say, well, you know what? It says right here that we fail to read the context. We fail to read the Bible as redemptive history. No, what we're trying to live out in the church, what we're trying to share with the world is the story of God's redemption, God's transformation of our own hearts that we are no longer people who are caught and stuck in our sin, but we are people who are forgiven and freed by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And God's invited us to be part of that story and to share that story with our world. And that's what we're committed to, reminded of today as we come to the table. We're here at the table, not because we have all the right answers on every question that faces public policy, Not that we have better insights that the world needs to simply pay attention to us because of our smarts, our wisdom, but because God in grace brings us to know him. And we come to the table not to prove how right that we are or get the power to do things our way, but to remember who it is that we belong to, whose authority we live under, that we are not our own, but we belong to Jesus Christ.
And so we may seek through our governments to promote peace and restore what is broken, but we remember that hum we live in humility before the one who alone can promote peace in our souls and restore the broken relationships among us and between us and God. And it's because of that work of Jesus that we can confess that God is our sure defense. Not the securities, not the, the things that the world longs to accumulate. And so this week, we have an important opportunity to see how our system works. Leaders in our country and our state will be elected. Decisions will be made. It's a gift that we have because of the form of government that we live under. But our goal this week as God's people is not simply to win political battles, but to live as witnesses to the king whom we ultimately serve, the judge of all the earth, the one to whom we entrust our souls, and the one whom we represent in this broken world as ambassadors of the king. And so we obey God first, but we also, no matter what happens in the systems around us, we respect the authorities that rule. We pray for the authorities that rule over us that it would be through them that we can indeed see God ruling over us. Let's pray.